Hello to you all. Thanks a lot for coming through. I hope you've got a bit of brain power left. I'm operating at about 20%, so if you notice anything odd, just bear with me, okay? Cool, so as you can see, um, the talk is on using GitOps for continuous delivery to multiple Kubernetes clusters. And I know that's a mouthful, but I had to get you in here somehow, right? Uh, my name is Lukonde Mwila, or you can call me Luke, and I'm a principal technical evangelist at SUSE. If you have no idea what that title means, you're in a safe space. I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> so in addition to that, I'm also an AWS hero, specifically a container hero, and I'm also a HashiCorp ambassador. If any one of you want to get in touch with me afterwards, you can feel free to do so on LinkedIn or Twitter, um, or subscribe to my channel on YouTube. It's nice to see a couple of intellectuals in here. I'm a former intellectual, so thanks for the love. Um, so previously, I had uh, experience in application development, both web and mobile, specifically working on business systems, and then transitioned to consulting in the financial services sector. Um, the focus at that point was cloud solution architecture and implementation, as well as DevOps workflows. So this is what I have lined up for you today. I'm going to start off by sharing my GitOps story or journey, and I'm hoping that that will be useful for some of you that may be facing particular issues that will be, that you'll resonate with what I went through, or maybe it's something that's further down the road, but even if you're here for pure interest's sake, um, I think you'll still find it useful. After that, I'll define GitOps, and then um, I'll speak about how GitOps and Kubernetes are complementary. And then we'll transition into sharing a little bit about uh, GitOps tools or operators that are particularly useful. And then I'll expand on the one that I'll be using in this particular session in my demo. And after that, um, I'll talk a bit about the benefits and the challenges. And once we're done with that section, I'll transition to the demo section. And you'll notice that the demo is split into a couple of different areas. For starters, I'll show you the live state of my cluster. And I just want you to take note of the version that I have running for the example application. And when I'm done with that, I'll take a step back and take you through the entire workflow overview. So it, it's a GitOps CI CD pipeline, but there are a lot of pieces involved in there, and I don't want you to feel like there's a lot of cloak and dagger or some smoke screen, and all we have is this automated process and just tell you at the end it worked. So we're gonna take a bit of a dive in there so you can understand exactly what's happening under the hood. And uh, then I will update my application and push some code daring to do that. Let's hope the demo gods are with me. And um, while the, law, while the uh, CICD pipeline is actually running, I'll take some questions if there are any in that particular section. If there are no questions, then we'll all enjoy the lovely task of checking out CI logs and wait for the pipeline to finish and then review the deployment. For starters, my GitOps story. Uh, so a couple of years ago, I was part of a team that was building out um, infrastructure, as well as Kubernetes clusters, and we were responsible for maintaining them and optimizing them. And for the sake of context, all of this was in the AWS environment, and we had a cluster per environment model. So that means we had a dev cluster, stage cluster, and a production cluster. This was for a banking solution that consisted of a growing number of microservices. Now, a particular challenge that we were facing at the time was in our continuous delivery. So we knew that the business priority was find an optimal and a scalable way of building and shipping software. Great slogan, right? Throw it on a t-shirt. Unless you're in the team who's actually doing the groundwork, then it changes the ball game completely. And so what we were actually doing is in our pipelines, we had, of course, the source stage and the CI stage. Some of you might be wondering, where is your CD stage? That's, uh, that's where the challenge was. So in our continuous integration step, uh, we were following the typical flow of build the application and test it and provided that all that succeeds, then go ahead and build the relevant container images and push them to their respective repositories. Once we've got a new version in our Docker repositories, or if you're using ECR, whatever the case may be, um, we would then proceed to write out different Helm commands as part of our CI stage. So a very procedural approach. And generally that worked, but that is definitely not an optimal approach. And it's not a good look when uh, one week you're busy trying to optimize things and you're working on the build config scripts and your teammates check in on you or leads or different stakeholders and then the following week it's, uh, hey, so what are you busy with? Yeah, we're uh, optimizing those scripts. Okay, two weeks, that's okay, that's not bad, we can live with that. Third week, hey, so what are you busy with? Those scripts, so there's actually something else that we left out. <laughs> and that's what happens when you're following a procedural approach. 
and you're trying to do things at scale. Um, we quickly found out that we were spending an unnecessary amount of time just writing these Helm commands over and over again. And like I said, there's some context in, this, in which this can work, but it's definitely not an optimal solution. So as you would expect, we as a team decided to engage in some R&D. And we knew that we needed to have a continuous delivery tool. However, we didn't want to put the cart before the horse. We know that in our space, we get really excited about all the shiny tools that exist out there that we knew will probably do the job for us. But more important than that, we wanted to find a solution model that actually met our requirements and would help us with some enhancements. So we took our time and we engaged with other teams that had a lot more experience than us and we found that GitOps was the shoe that fit. It was a model that was going to allow us to automatically deliver all of our Kubernetes resources, the, whether it's raw manifest files or Helm charts, down to the relevant runtime environments in our Kubernetes clusters. And that should already give you a bit of an idea of what GitOps is. So it's a paradigm or a model that brings together two worlds that are akin to modern software development. Your Git, which we typically use for version control of our uh, of our software, it's the, usually the single source of truth for your application source code, and then ops, which uh, represents the modern DevOps workflows. And so, with GitOps, this essentially allows you to not only use Git as the single source of truth for your application source code, but also the infrastructure layer. Now, sometimes there's some misconceptions around GitOps and Kubernetes. A lot of people think that GitOps is exclusive to that, but that is not the case at all. However, um, they go so well ha uh, together because they have this complementary approach, uh, which is based on the fact that GitOps has a declarative model. For those of you who are familiar with Kubernetes' inner workings, Kubernetes supports both a declarative system as well as a procedural system. And so, uh, just to expand a little bit on that, Kubernetes has uh, components running inside of the control plane known as controllers, and those controllers are continuously watching what is the life state of the cluster and what is the desired state of the cluster, and their job is to essentially make sure life state matches desired state. Now, when you take on a GitOps model, you are essentially fully embracing those declarative APIs, and the GitOps tool or operator will essentially extend the controller pattern so that now the new desired state will be based on what is inside of your Git repository. That becomes the single source of truth. So anytime it's doing a comparison with what's in the live state, it will take a look at your Git repository and see that as the desired state. You basically do away with the ad hoc commands directly to the API server. Cool, so just a little bit about some GitOps tools or operators. So the team I was in uh, years ago, we worked with Argo CD, and Argo CD is really popular. If any of you pay attention to what's happening in the CNCF landscape, you might have noticed that it's been growing drastically. A number of companies are adopting Argo CD for um, their GitOps strategies, and it's a really cool tool. Um, I love its user interface as well. Um, other popular ones uh, are Flux. Flux and Argo are probably the top two um, GitOps tools out there. And Flux is brought to us by uh, Weaveworks. So they actually, Weaveworks actually coined the term GitOps. And then on the far, my far left, but your right, is Fleet. And Fleet is from the same team that brought you Rancher, which is uh, SUSE. And that's the one that I'll actually be demonstrating today. And I thought it might be useful to understand a little bit about how it works under the hood. And for starters, I think it's always good to have a conception around even how something works at the most basic level. You could create your own GitOps tool if you wanted to. I'm not recommending that you do that. People have done the hard work. Don't go and reinvent the wheel. But if you want an idea of how the inner workings actually go, you would essentially do something like create a cron job. And that cron job would essentially, you know, at a certain schedule but that you determine, clone a certain Git repository, clone it into a container, and inside of that container you would run a kubectl or kubectl, um, specifically a diff command to compare what's been deployed to the cluster, so that's the live state, and compare to what resources exist in, the, in, the, in your Git repository that you just cloned. And then based on whatever you want to determine, whether it means you want to carry out a new version, carry out a release of a new version, or if you want to roll back based on the difference that's been picked up, that's essentially the job that a GitOps tool is doing. But there are a lot of sophisticated things taking place, and these um, tools capture that. So Fleet's architecture has a number of components. 
but I'm just going to touch on these three over here. We've got the fleet manager, which does a lot of the heavy lifting. This is where a lot of controllers are. And it's the same job that your controllers do just in the normal context of Kubernetes. So now, because fleet is essentially managing continuous delivery to the downstream clusters, it's going to be watching their live state and comparing that to the desired state in the Git repositories. And so you'll notice there's another component there called the fleet cluster agent. So the fleet cluster agent is deployed to your downstream cluster. That fleet cluster agent is continuously communicating with the fleet manager, informing it on what the, the live state actually is. And then the last one over there is the Git repo, which is a custom resource definition, and it's kind of self-explanatory. That is essentially where you would be defining the Git repository that you want fleet to watch. Cool, let's talk a bit about some of the benefits. Um, out of curiosity, is there anyone here using a GitOps model for their deployments to Kubernetes? Oh, perfect crowd for the topic, great. Okay, cool. So um, the first one that I'll talk about is infrastructure as code. Um, does anyone here build out any kind of infrastructure in their day job, or have you done it before? Great, cool. I'm assuming you're using infrastructure as code for that. Cool, I see some nods. There might be someone who was a little shy and like, I'm just not gonna say anything here. Cool, um, but that in comparison to doing things manually, um, you know, it, it's a dream. Doing things manually is a nightmare. Fitting for a POC, but can you imagine having to do that for different environments? That's intense, especially the more complex that your architecture gets. And it's also, you're setting yourself up for configuration drift. So infrastructure as code essentially allows you to ha reach a point of stability with your infrastructure as software. And you basically now have a reliable form so that you can repeat that even for other environments. You get it working in dev, then the next time you're spinning up the infrastructure for other environments, you would essentially use that single source of truth. Other benefits with this would be repeatability, which is very similar to what I just described. The fact that you got it working for dev and you've got a stable version, you can now easily repeat that process. More than that, you can even share that with other teams, and that's something that um, we had the chance to actually do. We were able to share our source code with other teams, and they were able to replicate their environments, um, which is a big benefit. Another one is infrastructure as code is self-documenting. Now, provided that you can understand the syntax, um, you would essentially be looking at the live state of your environment. And that's amazing. It's all captured in your source code, provided that you're actually following a proper system and you're, you've actually deployed what's in there, then you can be looking at the code and be assured that that's exactly what's in the, the live environments. And I still remember times when um, we would hit the wall or have some serious issues in our live infrastructure, and we would have even solution architects who weren't necessarily involved in the day-to-day -day coding, but they would go through the IAC with us. Now, in this context, this was Terraform, and they'd be able to actually in be involved in the process of resolving some of the issues. They never have to log into the console. All they'd, all they'd be looking at was this infrastructure as code and say, well, it looks like, so you've deployed this type of load balancer. Could that be the issue? And I specifically remember a situation, this is after 12 a.m., and those of us who were involved in the day-to-day -day coding of the infrastructure as code were all just looking at it and trying to figure out what's wrong. And um, one of our solution architects pointed out, he's like, should that be there? Like, no, no, that shouldn't be there. And that's how we resolved an issue. So this is a huge benefit. And then Git workflows, and this is a little bit of a no-brainer, right? This is kind of like your bread and butter when it comes to software development. Um, just the benefit of having quality gates, pull requests, and um, merges, and even having branching strategies. You can do that as well with your, with your infrastructure now, and that's a huge, huge benefit. Then there is the declarative paradigm. I spoke a bit about what we were doing with the procedural approach in the CI stage. Now, writing out scripts is fun when you just start and you really get a cool high when you get to your desired outcome. But as things get complex, become more complex, it's not fun. You know, you don't want to have hundreds of lines of all these scripts just to get to a desired outcome. That's, a, that's what a procedural approach gets you. Um, and there's a place for it, right? That's essentially what most of our build config scripts are. But a declarative paradigm or model essentially empowers you or enables you to just define the desired outcome, and the system will take care of all the intermediary steps. So in your Git source, all you have over there is the desired outcome, and your GitOps operator takes care of all the intermediary steps. 
Then we have Im immutable infrastructure. This builds off infrastructure as code in terms of giving you reliability. So immutable infrastructure can be a little bit misleading with the name. It doesn't mean that your infrastructure never changes. It simply means that if you want to release a new version, it will completely replace what exists at that point in time. You're basically working with versions of your infrastructure, and that protects you from configuration drift. And the last one is a little bit of a no-brainer. Um, this is all about automation and velocity. So you get to bring that to your infrastructure layer as well, the same way that you do with your application source code. Now, I love GitOps, and I consider myself a big advocate for it, but not everything is peachy keen. There are some serious issues. The first one is not so much a technical issue, but actually a people issue or a culture issue. Uh, if you've got a team of operators or the people who are responsible for managing deployments or operating on the Kubernetes cluster, if they've got a particular system of just running ad hoc commands or they say at a certain point in time in the week and um, within this hour block, that's when we run all our kubectl or kubectl commands, um, that's going to have to change completely. Everything now has shifted to having Git as the single source of truth. And so they have to follow the same process that your application development teams would essentially be following, and they do that for their infrastructure as well. This might seem like a small thing, but it's a big change when you've been doing something the same way for a long time, to now follow pull requests for your infrastructure and have quality gates before you make any changes to the cluster. In addition to that, there is universal best practices or patterns. Now, this is not to say that there aren't a number of good tips or pointers out there that you can follow when you're adopting a GitOps model. Um, however, I find that when you're doing these things in an enterprise context, things are, the, con the contextual issues make it very hard to easily export to another team. Um, so you might have established some best practices within your team, and if you know another team uh, that is also making use of a GitOps model, it's very difficult at times to transfer certain things. So universal best practice is a bit challenging, but there's certainly good, there are a number of good things that you can still adopt. And one of them is something I actually spoke about in my previous talk earlier on, and that's uh, policy enforcement. So when Git becomes your single source of truth, you want to make sure that anything that gets deployed to the downstream clusters actually meets a certain criteria. So with policy enforcement, whether you're using tools like new vector or the tree, that would allow you to essentially put um, sta certain security standards in place to make sure we should never deploy any resources where the root, where um, containers are using the root user. You know, putting things like that. And I see a couple of people laughing, so maybe you have stories. Um, Things in addition to that would be maybe you want to secure yourself from exposing too many node ports in your underlying infrastructure. So you can essentially put a protective measure in place to make sure no node port services are ever created. And then also, if you're going with a particular strategy where you only want to expose a single load balancer and so you deploy an ingress and that load balancer is the only entry point into the cluster and then your ingress essentially manage, has routing rules to manage where the traffic gets proxied to, um, you can also block the creation of load balancer services, and that also protects you from a costing perspective. So these are just some of the examples that are, they're good tips that exist out there, but I'm very reluctant or hesitant to say that they are universal best practices at this point in time. Then there's simultaneous software updates, and this one I'm actually going to leave to a little bit later when I get to the demo, because I think it'll make a lot more sense then. Um, but then there's Git repo planning. Again, this is one of those things that can be a serious gotcha. At face value, it's kind of like, what's so hard about planning for your Git repository? Just create a Git repository and start pushing code to it. Not, not really, especially depending on your architecture. And again, if that's going to be the single source of truth for everything, then you need to plan around that. Um, I remember being part of a team where the developers had created, um, I just pinned the blame. I was part of the ops team, so uh, yeah, but yes, it was the developers. So they decided to create a mono repo, and mono repos are cool and they're very popular, but it's not the right way of thinking if you're going to adopt a mono repo because Facebook are doing it. You're not Facebook. Again, you have to consider your particular context. All right? So even if you are going to go with an approach where each single, each microservice has its own repository, you need to understand the why behind that and consider what the implications will be for your entire GitOps strategy as well. So you need to plan around that, and it's not so simple. By the way, just an interesting thing. When we had a conversation with the developers and asked them, so why did you go with the mono repo? Just because. 
Okay, so we've seen the benefits and the challenges. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to show you um, the life state of the cluster. And by the life state of the cluster, I'm specifically referring to the workloads that I have deployed. Okay, so I hope you can see that clearly. I tried to zoom in quite a bit. I know the lighting might be affecting it um, to some degree. Um, is it clear at the back there, relatively? Okay, sweet, awesome. So um, there are two ways of making use of Fleet, by the way. You can either install it standalone in your Kubernetes cluster, or you can um, install Rancher, because Rancher will come with Fleet under the hood. And the benefit with going with Rancher is you get a whole bunch of additional features for managing your Kubernetes clusters. So that's the approach I'm going with. Also, you get the benefits of a sweet UI. Um, so over here, I'm currently in Rancher, and you'll notice that there are three clusters over here. The one right at the bottom is local, so that's where Rancher is actually running. And then the other two are EKS clusters. One is beta and one is Charlie. So I'm just going to be working with beta. So in this tab over here, I've got, um, this is the beta cluster, as you can see over there. And so I'm focusing on just the pods that are running. Let me just quickly refresh this. Awesome, and I'm gonna scroll down, and I hope this is visible for all of you. So I've got three replicas for a microservice called orders, and as you can see over there, the version that is running is 0.2.0. .0. Can everyone see that? Awesome, cool. So I'm gonna be upgrading this and releasing a new version. But like I said, there are gonna be a number of steps in between, and that's what I want us to cover next so that there's clarity on how this is actually taking place. Let's just expand that again. So this is where we're going to deal with the workflow overview. And um, again, I'm excited. I get to use my makeshift lightsaber, the pointer. Um, I know for those who are actually tuning in and streaming, it's, you know, it doesn't work out well because they can't see it. Text on the background, can everyone see? Kind of, sort of? OK, well, I'll try to be very clear about the different steps. So for starters, this is our step numero uno, build and test the application. Again, just if you think back to what I shared about my story, that's one thing that we were doing. And then the next step is I'm going to build the container image and then push it through to do my Docker Hub account. So all of this is happening in GitHub Actions, by the way, hence the, the pretty logo over there. So once I've pushed um, the new version to my Docker Hub account, the next thing is to work with my Helm chart repository, which is a separate repository inside of GitHub. That repository is actually the single source of truth that Fleet is going to be working with. And so what I'm going to do is, now that I've got a new version in Docker Hub, I'm going to clone that repository into my CI stage. And once I've done that, I'm going to update the relevant Helm chart. In this case, it's for orders. And I'm going to update specifically the values file for orders with the new image tag. And I'm going to be using a tool called YQ for that. And once I've updated that, the next thing that I have to do is to push those changes, because they're local to the container in the CI stage, commit and push those changes back to the remote repository. So push that back to GitHub. And once that change has been detected, remember, Fleet is continuously watching um, that particular repository as the single source of truth. And Fleet will compare that to my beta cluster and say, hey, um, the single source of truth no longer has 0.2.0 .0 for the deployment. It's got 0.2.1. Therefore, I'm going to get to work. I'm going to pull that, and I'm going to deploy that to the downstream cluster. Now, because I have love for you, I thought it would be useful to give you as, as close as possible as, as we can get with a real-world uh, deployment strategy. Uh, the re in reality, you're going, to have, you're going to be working with some kind of deployment strategy, whether it's AB or Blue Green or Canary. So as part of this process, I'm going to have a Canary deployment um, as well. And so for those of you that are, are unfamiliar with what that actually is, this essentially means that when you're releasing a new version, you're going to have both the old version and the new version running in parallel. And you slowly increment the amount of traffic that you're redirecting to the new release. Okay, so the old release is known as the primary release, and the new one is known as the canary release. And you can do this in two ways. You can use a service mesh if you want to accomplish this, but I don't like service meshes. So I'm using Nginx Ingress. 
And you can configure this entire process in terms of how much weight you want to have as the maximum. So that means that when it gets to 50%, then all of the traffic should, or rather the canary release should essentially be promoted to primary. You get to configure that. You also get to configure how long you want this entire process to be and how long it takes for those incremental steps to take place. And you can automate that process with a tool like Flagger. So I'm using Flagger for that. And um, some of you might be wondering, well, how do you actually know when you're following that weighted um, particular approach, right? We're, in we're increasing from zero to 5%, 10%. That's what I'm going with in this particular case every five seconds. And I have 50% as my max. So you can configure load tests to check the health of those changes, hence Prometheus being there. I'm going to be uh, scraping the metrics for that. In addition to that, you can also have acceptance tests. And you can add different types of acceptance tests based on what you're doing. So you've got a new release. If there was a particular endpoint that you added to your application, sorry, if you've got a new, um, if you've got um, a new endpoint that you added and this particular source code that you added, you can also have that as one of the tests that you actually run. And provided that those tests are passing, when you're stress testing it, then you can essentially be promoting based on that. Cool. So up next, I'm going to app, uh, update the application source code. I had to change the theme because of the lighting. Can't say that I like this one as much as my other one. Any VS Code lovers out there? VS Code lovers, nice. We win, I think there was more than 50% <laughs> who put up their hands. <laughs> what we do is we win. Right. <laughs> I'm not gonna pass any comments about IntelliJ. Okay, all right. Great, so. Um, over here, I have my main.yaml file, and I thought it might be useful to go through this briefly, not in detail, because this is essentially a translation of what was on that workflow diagram that I took you through. So the main.yaml file is essentially the configuration file for um, GitHub Actions. And so if you notice these environment variables over here, um, that are being exposed, the Docker ID, the Docker password, and the access token. The Docker credentials are stored as secrets in GitHub, and so that will essentially allow me to be able to log into my Docker registry for all the Docker commands that I'll be running. In addition to that, I have my access token, because remember, I'm going to be cloning another Git repository into the CI stage, so I have an access token that I'll be using to give me the relevant permissions to actually clone that repo as well as push it back. And the steps, as I've commented out um, in these different parts over here, so as you'd expect, install the relevant dependencies, log into my Docker registry, and then, like I said, I'm going to be using YQ to update the relevant YAML file, so that's what's happening over here, then proceed to build and test my application. For the, the Java and the Python enthusiasts, you're probably irritated that I'm using Node.js as an example. <laughs> And um, you'll notice over here that I'm taking my version from the package.json file and, store, and storing that in an environment variable over there. And so that's the same one that I'm going to use when I push to my Docker Hub account. You can see over there, I've taken that particular tag. So once I'm done with that phase, the next thing is to actually clone the repository, the other repository, the one with the Helm charts. You can see over there, that's, this is the section where I'm essentially doing that. So I create a temporary directory, and I clone, into, I clone the repo into that directory, check out to the relevant branch, which in this case is called fleet, and then I CD into the right directory, and I'll show you this repo just for a bit of context. Run an ls command just to make sure I'm in the right place. Got scars from some history over there. You want to make sure you're in the right directory when you're running certain commands. And then um, once I've done that, the next thing is to essentially use YQ with the particular environment variable to update, as you can see over here, the deployment.image tag property in my values file. I'm going to scroll a bit to the right so you can see that this is for the values file. And once I'm done with that, CD right back to the root of that particular repo and then commit and push those changes. So I'm in the orders API. I'm updating that to 0 0.2.1. And um, there's no real database. So right now, I've just got a bunch of orders over here, and I'm going to add another one. Let me save that. And I'm going to change this to DevConf Joburg. Let 
Uh, we're not going to give Yaten two orders. Uh, we'll just say Adam at the back over there from Alan Gray has just placed an order on my e-commerce website. So next thing to do. This is not the time. <coughs> CD into orders. Yeah, this time. And I'm going to push those changes. Great. So that should all be in my repo now. And if I were to head over to GitHub Actions, and there we go. You can see bumped version and added order for Adam. So this is going to just take a short while to run. Let's uh, cross our fingers. But in the meantime, so that you're not bored watching logs, if there are any particular questions, I can address some of those now, and then we'll review the deployment. Yes? So um, I saw that you're running two concurrent versions. Um, the old version and the new version. Yes. Time yes. Um, do you do connection draining as in just drain out the already connected clients, or do you um, actively? I should, should I start from <laughs> scratch? No, I, I heard so, you, so, but you can, you can continue. <laughs> so do you still actively serve traffic to, let's say it's a backend system, yeah. an API, do you actively serve new traffic to the old uh, version, or do you move all um, new traffic to the new version? Because <clears throat> I ask because yeah. we have some automated tests, yeah. um, in product, just read tests in production uh, mm -hmm. for a particular client. Yeah. Um, and some tests fail because they're still hitting the old API yes. instead of the new one in certain cases. Yeah. Um, so do you connect it, does it do, I, I forgot the name of the tool. Does uh, it's it Flagger. Do, Flagger. Yeah. Does, it, does it do connection draining or does it just still actively serve to the old API? Right, yeah. So the whole process is automated. Let me just quickly open something here so you can see the different um, versions running in parallel while I answer that question. Just so you can see, we'll have primary and canary. There we go. So you can see 0.2.1, the containers are being created, and we've still got the old one. So this might actually, this will answer your question. So this is the old version. And if I was to just continuously you know, refresh this, so at the moment, you'll see we're not seeing any response for, that includes Adam's order. And I could just keep hitting this. But the reason that that is happening is because, remember, it's following a weighted approach. And you can configure that weighted approach, how long it takes to increase the amount of traffic that you're redirecting. So whether you're using an, engine, whether you're using an ingress or a service mesh, you get to actually configure that. So you are actively serving um, your, you know, if this is in production, you are actively serving your clients both versions. But because you've split the traffic, you don't know which one your client is going to get. So like at this point, I don't necessarily have control over which one I'm going to get, but I just keep refreshing this. And you can see over there, now we've got Adam over there. But if I refresh it, I may not get Adam again. There you go. You know, Adam's now missing. So that's the whole thing. And there, you know, big companies also that are following a canary approach, it's the same thing. You know, I've watched a video where um, YouTube um, were following a canary approach, and someone actually was able to see that they were testing out a new thumbnail, an automated automated generated thumbnails. Um, that was something that YouTube was testing out. So some clients or users would have been able to see that. So that's why it's important to make sure that you have tests for that promotion. It, you know, otherwise, what's the point of, you know, of even following a weighted approach for the promotion? You might as well just completely release the new version. You want to make sure that you're actually actively testing load and adding different acceptance tests that are based on the changes that you've made for the new release. I hope that helps answer your question. Yes, I'll wait for the mic to go there. OK, cool. All right, so we've still got both releases. So this means that we haven't hit 50% yet for our canary. Uh, yep. Hi. Hey. Sorry, um, I actually also use Rancher. And just like on nice. top of his question, I, I thought it was a problem going to solve in the future. Isn't there like sticky sessions or something? Because I've done this refresh where then I'm switching between the servers and sometimes getting like 
um, static files being served from like another version rather than like the one that we just deployed. Right. So is this something that's acceptable or maybe there's a solution to it? Sorry, is your, is your question specifically in context with like Canary releases or um, maybe I'm not understanding. Well, okay, well in the context of Canary releases, yeah. yeah. Yes, but I think maybe there's something else funny where we're doing deployments where um, it's not exactly Canary because we, we don't sure. do Canary. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't entirely understand that, but um, maybe we can elaborate on it yes. after, or unless you, yeah, you can. No, sorry, let, let me be more, okay, so yeah, sure. uh, just as you showed now, mm -hmm. you're doing a refresh. Yes. It's going to A or B. Right, yeah. Right, so is that acceptable, you know, or is it part of Canary, or is there a way to force it, okay, well, like, as a user myself, yes. yeah. isn't there a way to have, like, a sticky session so that I always get consistently sent to one right. server rather than... A or B. Yeah, so if you think about it, it's somewhat of a black box, right? Because in the same way, let's say, for example, YouTube's uh, feature, like we weren't informed about that, right? That's something that someone discovered. And part of this is because you're essentially putting a protective measure in place because you're testing out something. You want to release a new version, but you might end up rolling back. So for the users, they don't have visibility of that. And on your particular end, if you're testing this, you actually want to be able to get a real life experience of what a user would actually have, whether you know, when you just keep hitting that, which is why you also have that load testing infused in this as well. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, Adam and then you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, real quick, um, how much more time do I have? I don't want to drag this out. I might have hit. Ten minutes. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, Adam. Um, I just wanted to ask, what's the benefit of having a centralized repository for all of your, I assume like all your Helm charts are in that centralized repository that you're updating? Right, yes, yeah, yeah. Why did you choose to do that rather than maintaining a Helm chart for the specific application inside the application repository? Is there a benefit or just what you choose to do? Yeah, the demo? thankfully that's an easy one. It was just for the demo. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so look, again, that would also be part of the planning. If you think back to what I said about the whole Git repo planning thing. So that's kind of like, a, that is a mono repo approach, right? But it adds its own kind of complexity. I mean, you saw like in the CI stage, now I'm CDing into um, the orders fo folder to make sure I'm in the right directory and then run the relevant commands. Can get rid of that and just rather maintain the life cycle of. Um, the different Helm charts, right, which is a really good approach as well. So I'm glad you asked that question because um, Helm charts are also going to have, you've got application versions and then there's also Helm chart versions. So they have their own life cycle. So that's something you also have to consider which will have an impact on the particular repository you go with. So super important question. Yeah, so definitely to simplify that, split it up. This was primarily just for the demo. Yeah. This should be simple. Um, I'm just curious about Rancher because I'm yes. not very familiar with the tech stack you just dis displayed. Oh, with Rancher. Yeah. yeah. Um, is this something, because I work in an industry that's highly regulated payments, right? Sometimes you have to deal with a high level of security. So I'm just wondering, is this something that can easily be deployed on-prem, on your cloud, in a container? Um, and I'm also wondering, like, how deep does it go into um, the monitoring of your pods? You know, does it just sort of hit an API and gives you like external metadata information or yeah. logs and all of that jazz? Yeah, great question. So um, if you're familiar with how Kubernetes works, its job is essentially orchestrate containers, right? Now, Rancher's job is to help you orchestrate your Kubernetes clusters. That's, that's one of the most simple ways of helping you understand what Rancher's job actually is. Um, Cluster manage, it's a cluster management platform. So the same way K8 orchestrates and manages containers, Rancher's job is to manage and orchestrate your clusters. Because cluster management um, is complex. There are a lot of things that it entails, right? It's a really hard job. So Rancher essentially helps you have a single pane to be able to consolidate management of all of your downstream clusters. It simplifies the process and helps you have a centralized place in carrying out your management processes. So that's its main job. Um, with regards to things like monitoring, because you asked about that, so there is um, a section in Rancher as well when you're in a particular cluster, actually while I'm here, you've got apps and marketplace. Um, apps and marketplace, and if I head over to charts, these are essentially tools that we're quote unquote recommending that you should be installing in your downstream clusters. And so this also helps you simplify the process of installing um, important tools. So for example, on 
your right and my far left uh, CIS benchmarks, which is something that I spoke about in my security talk. That's an important tool that helps you essentially check the security installation and certain standards for your particular Kubernetes cluster. Furthermore, you can see there are others like Istio, Longhorn, and this one will answer your question specifically, monitoring. So this is a particular monitoring stack. It obviously it consists of Prometheus and Grafana. And if I install that on my downstream cluster, your visibility of the particular downstream cluster you're managing with Rancher will actually modify to accommodate um, the fact that you've now installed those particular tools. You can still access the independent um, URL for the Grafana dashboard and share that as per norm, um, but it would modify and you'd get a, a lower level of what's going on in your cluster. So it's actually meant to help with things like that. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Great. I have another one, but I think sure, let me just double check on the timing. Are we still good or, or is that it? Almost out of time. Okay. So, well, we can still chat afterwards. Thank you so much for listening. I certainly hope it was helpful. Cool.